I'm not sure how much video I'm going to do, but I did want to do a little video of this um, experiment here. I've got this slurry that you just saw from Otterdal Kvike from Norway from probably about a year ago. It's been in my fridge. What I'm going to do is try to use it today, but I'm going to see if I can wake it up a little bit. So I have a cup of the first runnings. which is being collected there. It's about 15 bricks, so I'm gonna dilute it with water, so I'll bring the temperature down, and it'll make it about, uh, you know, seven and a half bricks, it'll be about like 10.30, which is good for a yeast starter amount. Then I'm gonna scoop some of this uh, slurry into my sanitized Erlmeyer flask, put it on the stir plate, and then I still have, you know, collect the wort, boil, chill. So I still have probably like two hours before I'll be trying to pitch it. And I'm curious to see if it'll show any signs of uh, waking up. So that's what I'm uh, doing right now. Let's see what happens. Okay, so here is this sanitized situation, which I thought about skipping that step. But then I thought, all right, it's only going to take a couple minutes. So sanitized spoon. I did this in my last first video when I um, used Chip's Otterdahl slurry. I wonder how this stuff smells. Let's see. Oh, it does not smell bad. It smells like beer and yeast. So this is probably a tablespoon, which is normally would be more. What I did with Chip's slurry is I used if you were to watch that video, um, two heaping half teaspoons, so basically like a teaspoon and a half of slurry, and that beer fermented fine, so that was definitely more than that, but it's also from, you know, however long ago. I'm kind of torn between just going with this and seeing what happens, um, or front loading it with a bunch more yeast. I don't know if that would be detrimental at all. I could always just give this a try, say that was a tablespoon, do this little starter, and then keep my uh, slurry jar just in the fridge on hand, on deck if need be. So maybe we'll give that a shot. So it's 10 o'clock and this is what it looks like. And we'll see when I get to pitching if it looks uh, any different. It's, I usually have more volume in there so it's a little bit spluttery, splattery, but uh, hopefully I'll be all right. So it was 10 o'clock, it is about noon. This is what I am seeing right now. Definitely seeing some bubbles on the top, some bubbles on the side. Whether or not it did anything super helpful, I don't know, but I will definitely pitch this yeast now and see when I notice active signs of fermentation and see how long it goes. It'll be really, Interesting to see if this 10-month, um, 11-month-old slurry can be used. If it's just been kept in that jar in the fridge this whole time. So I'll go pitch this now, and we will see. So it is now 10.30, and I've got it out on my porch, which is warm these days. And... It is rocking and rolling. It's been going for a while. Um, but I was out. So let's see here. Oh my gosh, that's even a lot more than it was. And I got my uh, gun here. So there you go, 88, it's going, it was like 89. So yeah, it's still toasty out here even though it's kind of cooler outside. So we'll just kind of monitor the temperature, but it definitely is working. And the, um, what, tablespoon or whatever of yeast from a year ago is working. 
and we'll see how she goes. Alright, here is the Otter Doll. It has now been in the keg for a month. And uh, it went into the keg after seven days. <laughs> which, I was just talking about how the Croizen lingered and it kept bubbling. But at some point I took a gravity reading and it was 1.009 is what I kegged it at. I don't know if it would have gone any lower, but at that point, since it started at 10.54, I thought, I'm satisfied with that. Let's just get it in the keg. If it was any drier, it might actually be detrimental. I like that mm -hmm. it's got this, like, for not having anything but two row, it almost has this weedy kind of body. Huh. But, um, yeah, that's a cool experiment. Like, I'm... It's, I'm glad to see that the slurry lasted uh -huh. just in the fridge, right? The full year. So that was the question of the summer was, <laughs> ha, was, cause this, I've now made three beers out of slurry. No, that's not true. Two beers with slurry from a year ago or around a year ago. And they both have worked two different, uh, Kvike strains. This one worked just fine. You saw the video. It was a big tablespoon. I did a activator type starter type thing. It fermented uh, in the mid to upper 80s. That should be in the video brew clips. But we were talking before we started rolling that it's pretty amazing how much flavor you get from the yeast alone. And the previous Otterdahl beer I made there's a video on that, and Joel and Hannah and I were drinking it, and we kept saying things like lemony, citrusy, um, I mean, lime. And I think you get all that on this, but now, I don't know if it's anything to do with it being around for a year or just oh. this particular beer, but I get more, I think we commented on this in the previous video, but I think I get more spiciness. I get, like, Saison. Is, uh -huh. I mean, it's mind-blowing that this is Turo and Amarillo, the spice and the like it's not funky but that like farmy ness to it huh. and the lemon black pepper it's cool Maybe like that otter doll grains of paradise or yeah. coriander i mean they're all this kind of the spiciness is kind of built into it i wonder if you made a well i, I think i've said this before you made a wit beer grain bill with this so you get an interesting beer but it won't be a, a wit beer yeah it almost has a jamminess in the aroma there is some residual malt character, just 12 pounds of our two row, 1054 to 1.009, one ounce Amarillo at bittering. So that's, it's not overcomplicated, but what I wanted to do was see if, if you're playing along at home and you get either a commercial strain of the Kvike, which then I don't know about the viability of that of doing the slurry, but if you do get an authentic one somehow, and you get the slurry and you put it in your Tostitos salsa jar, and you. <laughs> Is that what it was in? Probably. <laughs> something like that. You Not put even it in a the mason in, or in, a ball, just a straight up Tostito. Yeah. And then. Maybe that's where some of the spice is coming from. Jalapenos. God. It was and washed. Cumin. It was well washed. <laughs> but then the we're going to drink another beer right after this that I did the same thing with the Sigmund Uranus. That one also worked well, but it is a different result. That yeast gives a different result. Yep. No, that's the, this is definitely the spiciest, honestly, the most characterful I've seen that yeast yet. Really? I feel like, I mean, I've only done the raw, so I think the raw does this whole other thing where it's like really doughy, really malty. I think you gave it a good, clean palate to just do its thing. That's kind of what I did last year. And that's sort of the kick I got on early on, at least with this batch that was I was on that same trip. Like, let's just make a real simple beer and see what happens. So, you, it can it can work if you have an interest in doing that. I don't know what I don't know if that's the point of always having a slurry around of Kavik to yeah. be making it. So what I did this year with this beer is I took this slurry. And I put it into a, a jar, and now I have that in the fridge. So I could either use that more this year, or I could attempt to keep that another year. Let's see how that goes. In a jar of a salsa from New York City. New York City! Alright, thanks for watching. Uh, thanks 
Chip, we got one more to try. Catch I'm you later. I'm always happy to drink in a garage. Yeah, boy.